Hey, what's up? It's Jim, and this is the best things I saw in 2020. This is probably the latest I've ever put out a top 10 list of a year. Um, 2020 was uh, <laughs> a weird year, and especially for movies, and I really wasn't sure what counts as a 2020 movie, or like what I should put on here, or should I just make it top 10 best content, but there's like a lot of things that are content, so I wasn't sure what to do there <laughs> and it just doesn't it's confusing so i was just like fuck it it's gonna be a bit of seasons of tv that i liked it's gonna be a bit of mostly movies because that's clearly what i watch a lot of i don't know if top 10 lists make any sense anymore i i don't know but these are 10 things that i watched at some point and you know that's cool it was a weird year i i don't know I've always wanted to, I, I don't feel like TV's too broad to like do a top 10 of TV or something. All of these I have reviews out of currently, so they are all videos you can watch separately. Um, obviously I do the clip thing and everything like that, but I, I think 2020 was, you know, I, th I think I really loved everything that's in the top 10 list. I think you could find really great things and really great movies, but it was like kind of challenging to understand like what any of this all means and like the term of it just being content feels like very much prevalent like none of it means anything anymore so i've never really loved making top 10 i like looking at them but i don't make making them because oftentimes i'm like well on some days i like this more or whatever so relatively but i feel fairly strong about this list and all those things so let's get into the actual top 10 things i watched sort of whatever this is of 2020. so number 10 was a returning favorite for me, something I thought would never happen, but it did come back this year. And for me, it was one of the highlights that I actually got to really get into this show, which I'd never really gotten to in terms of a review series, but it was like really a joy and really inspiring actually um, to go back on and revisit the show. And I think it's probably one of the great uh, animated shows for me of the of this millennium. But um, I know a lot of people don't feel that way, but I feel like more people do, which is awesome. But that would be 12 Ounce Mouse season three. I think this is continued on in its strangeness, but unlike the action season and the just sort of weird existential <laughs> art house season, this is the strange dimensional sci-fi season would say this is the sci-fi season if there ever was one i kind of like this new bent on 12 on smiles because it's kind of like that weird tinge of sci-fi that like sci-fi fans like but like nobody else does and i think 12 ounce mouse is already that for animation so i'm not sure the venn diagram of people who even would be into both of these things but 12 ounce mouse season three does that and i like that it still can do strange weird things and still like you know have these characters like the guy with the sunglasses and the long hair whose name i didn't look up but i would have liked more spits and skillet together again I would have, you know, the idea of shark and rectangular businessman kind of being morphed together in this disgusting thing shows you, like, how these worlds and all these experiments with dimensions and simulations can, like, almost warp your identity, which I think is something Fitz is almost having to deal with, but also sort of is too drunk to care. It, it, it brings up the idea of creation and the creator and what that creation can be morphed into it makes me think what matt malero thinks of aqua teen <laughs> or pretty much anything he's created i i do think this is maybe matt malero's big opus kind of uh story and i i was so into it it's like the one thing i like about this is i think a lot of adult swim stuff from off the air to too many cooks to all the stuff they do can be strange and weird but this is one that i often think has a point and then sort of like doesn't give a shit about the point and does the lynchian thing but also is like well let's put a joke in here where this one guy's like killing funky little dragon things are we making a statement on dragon tails or is it just funny to chop off dragon heads i don't know but you're gonna go with it and it has that kind of like that nihilistic kind of approach of an aqua teen episode where like stakes don't matter which i know is like something you really wanted to bring to 12 months mouse and is there it feels like that attitude still there while still doing continuity it's like he he definitely cares about this characters and this continuity but almost has such a disregard for it as well which i just sort of love i don't mean that in a negative like he like he doesn't care about the continuity he clearly does but he almost can throw it away and reinvent it and shake it up 12 months does it not as a reaction to the previous season and almost feels like 
just where the creator wants to go, which I sort of really like about these seasons. All right, so number nine was an indie film that I feel like a lot of people forgot about, but I think it is it's worth revisiting. And even though I was a little too critical of it, probably in my review, I did actually very much enjoy it. And that was number nine with The Vast of Night. The Vast of Night is kind of a simply told, low budget, alien mystery movie. The kind of economical, bare bones kind of movie that critics go gaga for. And I really love it. <laughs> Two kids get into a mystery and much like a nice like boxcar children type beach read when you're nine years old you're in it and don't even care about plausibility not that it isn't plausible but i'm saying that's kind of how this film grabs you you have these two characters one uh dj everett played by jake horowitz uh he's a kind of a local celebrity in this very small town he's the dj on a friday night while everyone's at the big popular basketball game this is in the 1950s this girl who he's kind of friendly with and you see him talking to a lot in the beginning opening shot which follows them forever is a switchboard operator and she hears a weird sound tells him about it get obsessed with this weird sound play it over the radio and sort of unlock a huge mystery i like these kind of films because it's sort of simple but i love a good simple story that can kind of just wrap you up and you're so following the mystery i was so compelled by it even at parts was like I mean, maybe that's stupid, but I'm really into this. The direction of Andrew Patterson, which I don't think this movie is stupid. I think it's actually very, very good and very well directed. It shows me real promise from a good, I guess, sci-fi horror director. And it shows someone who understands period, loves Spielberg, loves being arty, but also understands how to tell a good fucking story, which might be the most Spielberg thing of them all. Uh, and number eight is Minari. I think there's a real art in making a good family drama and we don't get a lot of like really great ones usually and I'd say Minari is one of the best family dramas I've seen in a very long time. Not only does it get into how you know a change in you know location and stuff can affect your family but it gets into various dynamics. It talks a lot about the drive of the parents to want to do better or particularly the dad put them in a better position but also the idea that maybe this isn't the best decision maybe this is a bad idea maybe this is more about his ego and sort of this headstrong attitude that might not necessarily work out for him which is something i don't see i think people are a little too pious about being a father i don't know if isaac lee chung is or not if he isn't he has a very good grasp on what it is to be one because um, while i was watching this there's so many times where like you're like well i can't do this my entire life i have to do something that i feel like i'm good at and maybe i can prosper more but maybe that isn't the actual good thing and then you get upset and then you're trying to like make sure everything's right and you want to do right by your family and all that is in this film there's so many logistics about having a family that are emotional and hard and draining and all those things and in most family dramas that's sort of like you know just forgotten about but that is what this movie sort of is i think for someone who doesn't have a family that might not be interesting but figuring out like who's going to watch the kids are the kids going to have friends are you going to have enough money? What is the best way to do this? How am I going to do this situation? How you can, you know, he disrupts like the water in their house at one point because he's trying to use the water to kind of water the plants so that they can have more money for the food and the farm and have like a better life. I think there is a drive when you have a family that you want them to live a better life. You have a sense of pride in being able to take care of them. And that's, you know, obviously for... Uh, important for immigrants who leave a certain country to come to America for the American dream. And I think this is probably one of the best films I've seen about the American dream in a very long time. Number seven was a show that returned this year, which um, I felt very strongly about season one. I still really liked season two, maybe not as much as season one, um, but um, I still think is probably, again, visually probably one of the most cinematic things we have right now. And that would be number seven, uh, Primal Season 2. It's like watching a silent film, but it's like watching someone who is a visual stylist. And of course, one of the greatest animation directors currently, Gendy Tarkovsky, would of course be uh, very good at that. It makes sense, but seeing someone like that be able to go and really, you know, there's very, there's a little dialogue, spoilers I guess, not really. It's not a dialogue-based show either way. Like, most of the motivation is either through, they do a lot of sound design. I'm not going to say it's like a fully, like a silent thing, but you could probably watch this on mute or something and actually pretty much follow it um, but I would say that's hindering the experience because the sound design in this is actually rather rich it's interesting how 
compelling the show is and it shows you really have to have a really great visual stylist to get that to work as well as you can and i think this is such an amazing showcase for gendy that we really haven't gotten to see as much in the past decade when he's been stuck in hotel transylvania movies although those have been are not you know horrible or anything like that but they don't show exactly all the amazing things he can do that he can do in this like especially visually i know it's like maybe more violent or grown up and that's not why i think it's you know more serious or a bigger achievement i think more because visually there's just like so many cool things going on beautiful and amazing things going on just being able to see like you know someone's emotions without them you know them visually showing you or you know the amazing epic battles the goriness of it but also the character moments i noticed a lot of character beats in this that the last season and mainly what this show is probably known for is these epic episodes that they go on these amazing journeys and have these crazy action sequences that you could never have in live action and are just like a delight to watch they're just like amazing watching the animation flow in that way it's just like you can't believe like you know they came up with this idea it's just like beyond belief in some of them this season what i liked is more about the two characters of i guess spear and fang i look at them as guy and dinosaur i almost sort of it, this might sound strange i guess but i i almost don't really think of them as having names because they never refer to obviously they never refer to each other's names but i know spear and fang is a better way to refer to them because you know you can actually tell who i'm talking about but there's like only two characters so number six i have not seen all of what this is from this is from the small x series i've only seen two of them unfortunately i would like to catch up on the rest of them i don't know when i'm going to do that um but i found this entry which was pretty much a movie in my mind and whatever i know i'm sort of just picking an episode maybe but it is i think probably one of the best party movies i've ever seen and um i think um what steve mcqueen did with this it's just really fantastic i've watched it again once since it just has such an amazing vibe i've never seen someone get the environment of a party as well as this and i was just like kind of taken aback by how different this was for him and how perfectly it kind of captured that mood of a party which is certainly something we needed this year and that would be number six with lover's rock lover's rock is really just a very wonderful party movie and i think when you think of party movies you know there's all this like you know they're putting on the party of the century or like you know there's some crazy comedic reason they're doing it and all that stuff this is lover's rock is not that lover's rock is very small it's just about a house party in west london the small act series is all about west indian immigrants to specifically west london although the previous one mangrove was far more political this is just a one night a house party from beginning from setup to the next morning basically and additionally i would say there's sort of a protagonist but not really it's more atmospheric you kind of get the smells of the party you get the sweat of the party you get the wonderful reggae music in this like this is absolutely my favorite soundtrack of 2020 i was listening to i found a spotify playlist i'll try to link it in the description because it's really wonderful just like really great music it's like going to a great party you have a wonderful night you stay up too late you might have drank too much you probably danced with someone that you had a good time with and that's sort of it and this is kind of like a slice of life party movie, which I'm surprised more people don't do because this is just absolutely like incredibly engaging, almost like very arty at the same time. This plays so much into what Steve McQueen does as a director because he's so good at atmosphere. A lot of uh, people have brought up that like he's so good at doing these shots that hold too long that are like painful you know whether in 12 years a slave or hunger or or shame and in the mangrove he has one where a collar is on the floor kind of like moving back and forth after a police raid and he's very good at that atmosphere but i think in this he takes that skill he has with atmosphere and holding on shots too long and just gets that feeling of a party that felt so real to me i was like oh i know exactly that feeling like you know grinding with someone on the dance floor waiting in line for the bathroom you know the food that they're selling at the party just, just so many things like that that i just growing up in baltimore going to like kind of like punk show punk show parties or something like that and being there from the beginning to the end it just transported me to that all right so number five so i'm putting shows in here um i'm sort of cheat i mean this is this list doesn't make any sense but um i'm sort of cheating and i didn't want to put two seasons of a show on here so i'm sort of just giving it number five um but i have to say this is probably one of the big cult animated shows or cult shows going on right now that i feel like more people should be watching but 
its first two seasons were such accomplishments. I know people forget about season two. They talk a little more about season three, which fine, whatever. I mean, it's hard not to think about it because of Twitter and stuff, but um, number five is Infinity Train season two and three. The whole idea of Infinity Train is the idea of bettering yourself through this kind of therapeutic infinite train, I guess. And the whole idea of the numbers is once you have kind of bettered yourself, you can leave. And the whole idea of going through sort of a recovery process or therapeutic process or something like that is the idea of finding yourself. Not to say those people were not selves and didn't have an identity before, but the kind of sort of loss of yourself, loss of who you truly are, who you truly want to be. And in the first Infinity Train, that was Tulip after she had gone through a major thing, wasn't sure where she was, wasn't sure who she was after her parents' divorce, after everything that was going on in her life. In Infinity Train Book 2, it's very different because in a sense, this is about MT. This is not about Jesse. Jesse is a supporting character. This is about MT and the fact that she has rebelled from being the mirrored image of Tulip, which we saw in book one. She has rebelled and has decided not to just be the mirror image of Tulip, but decided to become her own self, which we got the beginning, the origin story of in book one. But in book two, what's happened to her is now she's really trying to get off the train and become her own self and that's a really interesting way to twist it because it is sort of like a mirror image of the first one but not entirely it's almost like a theory based sequel i think it is a beautifully uh written and beautifully thought out show that maybe certainly not enough people are talking about but i think the psychology and the intelligence of it is is so interesting to go into and re and i love even almost rewatching it and thinking about all the possibilities of ideas while also thinking about all the possibilities of worlds and theories and things that are going on within it it's such a rich intelligent smart world and just kept opening up more doors and more ideas throughout it getting me even more excited for this franchise to really continue i think that with book three you have people who are all really with the apex and with grace and simon they're flat out refusing to get any sort of help and to be stuck on this train for most of their childhood basically each book of infinity train or each season takes a totally different story than the other one um which i actually really like i've heard a lot of people say you can watch them in any order i don't think that's actually true um but um they do feel like very independent of one another and book one was very much setting up the plot the idea of it with tulip book two is more of like the idea of identity and your identity like what is the identity of people on that train of being in it of helping people like even though you know the the whole idea of the train is not really even concerned with your identity of mt's identity and then you get to book three and it's like well, what if people don't want to be helped and it's sort of like the idea of therapy of someone who like doesn't really want to get help and is just stuck in this perpetual cycle and that's basically what the apex is but they've sort of marketed it better than that <laughs> let's be cool let's like break stuff let's break all the rules and you know kind of like this whole idea of peter pan and the lost boys or something like that but with grace and simon ultimately what they've done i doubt their families even think they're alive at this point um they basically sacrificed their entire childhood not be educated not really have friends other than those experiences not see their families again they have basically decided to just break crap and not care about anything and that has been their lives for i don't i think it's like 10 years or something the whole idea of empathy in this season is a big deal but i don't think it's just about empathy because i think i mean it's, it is but it's kind of the idea of empathy through responsibility. So you did there, I had clips of both of them, so that's cool. All right, number four, I think I'm probably pushing it by putting this on here because I think for most people it's a 2019 movie, but I checked and I didn't put it on my best films of the year list then because I think I saw it after I made that list. And that was a shame because it was really great and probably one of the best romance films um, I've seen in a long time. And a film I still think about a lot, actually. Number four would be Portrait of a Lady on Fire. There's something kind of majestic about a real classically told love story. It feels sort of universal. It feels almost perfect in its tale of a romance. I don't see a lot of those anymore. Going through and researching this, I see a lot of people talking about how there isn't a lot of great romance films. 
and how a lot of romance films of this decade, the great ones, have been gay romance films, which is also probably true. I think this film is very upfront about what it's doing while also being about characters who cannot be very upfront about what they're doing. You have to hide in secret. But I wouldn't say this is like a hard film to necessarily get into. Not that that's a bad thing, really. I kind of quite like that about that. Although this film might feel inaccessible, it's actually incredibly accessible. It's very easy to understand, easy to get. All the metaphors are fairly easy to figure out, but it might feel a little limited and simple, but, uh, but I, I kind of really love that about it. It kind of makes it, in some ways, very rich about what it's doing. I think Portrait of Lady on Fire is kind of this beautifully told, wonderfully made kind of film about a, a really intensely passionate romance that couldn't live on because of society that wouldn't let it. But you can still feel that like wonderful, regardless of the fact that unfortunately it had to be snuffed out because unfortunately there wasn't any room for it. But in a brief moment of time, they really believed there was. Okay, number three uh, is, you know, um, I think one of the just really great I don't know. I don't have much to say about number three, except I really liked it. Sorry. Um, number three is Wolf Walkers. It's been around for centuries and centuries and kind of represents it to a new generation, making it almost like as impactful as clearly it was to him, like making that folklore live on through these animated films. And since animation is better at living on for decades and decades, probably be able to exist much past that. But Wolf Walkers is really also about the idea of kind of tradition, the idea of believing in kind of something bigger than yourself, believing in not going with like the established way you're supposed to behave or think or whatever society is dictating to you. And I think Wolf Walkers does that really well. In some ways, this film is much more kind of modern animation in terms of like things like Frozen. It sort of actually reminded me of that. A lot of what that film has to say about being yourself and not being constricted by how you feel like you should be minimized by society and so forth. Kind of just a really rich experience, you know. <laughs> I think what Wolf Walkers is kind of doing is just like giving so much love to kind of this kind of storytelling and storytelling in general It is kind of infectious. It makes you love this kind of storytelling and makes you love the idea of the different views of storytelling. It just shows you like maybe in a lot of ways what a great storyteller and what a great filmmaker and animator can really do when they're able to kind of let loose in such a way. And I think that's one of the things about Wolf Walkers is you see these little girls kind of like show their real personalities through being wolves. And in a way you also get to see these filmmakers and Cartoon Saloon and Tom Moore show their full personalities by telling this story. Number two um, kind of surprised me. And I guess for some people this could be considered a 2021 movie. And I'm sort of absolutely confused what year it is. I'd listed in my 2021 reviews playlist. But I'm going to count it as a 2020 movie because it's not made for an Oscars for that year. So I think that counts. I don't know. It's confusing. But I thought this was probably one of the more uh, angry, engaging kind of movies that kind of demanded a response from you in a way that I don't see that immediacy from mainstream movies nowadays and it just really grabbed me in a way that like really made me interested in, in history in a way and just made me really in awe of what's going to come next from this director and that would be number two with Judas and the Black Messiah. I think you could mistake and enjoy this film as just a sort of typical undercover crime movie basically like much like Donnie Brasco or something like that. But in fact, I find this film to be far more radical than any of those are. They might, you know, have people wear suits and, it, you know, acknowledge the time period, but none of them are trying to be as politically active as this film is and as radical and as anti-authoritarian as this film is. This film makes me question, like, did the studio system know this was happening or is the studio system this cool? Can crime movies be this interesting and fascinating and at the same time actually make me look up history and like sort of engage with it? And Judas and the Black Messiah is that takes, you know, the real life story of how the FBI killed Fred Hampton and how the FBI basically tried to destroy black leadership in the 1960s. That's something you should know. That is an actual thing that actually happens. The US government took out large black voices in the late 1960s because they did not want the growing civil rights movement to gain any power or even political power in the future. The FBI did take apart the Black Panthers. That is an absolute 100% thing that really happened. Uh, you should know. I mean, I think it's always been known. I didn't know the logistics of it, but I've always known that the FBI 
uh, took down the Black Panthers as they're gaining steam and basically mainly doing social programs that we should probably have in the fucking first place and still don't because they were threatened by people, you know, giving breakfast to little kids. That's literally what they did. Um, anyway, the FBI is racist and particularly was at the time and the US government's racist, but this should not be a shock to you, but it's also showing you the evil of authority and the evil that authority can rot on you on an organization that's trying to help the people and educate the people and how they used evil um, and how they co-opted someone who they knew was co-optable and um, brought them over to take down something that could have helped the people just because just because they didn't want to lose the position that they had. I think the real crime of this is that we as people were lost one of the great uh, minds of the time and i think it shows what's been happening to african americans this whole time and continues to happen and is not something that is fucking new at all and that's the thing that's most radical about it is oftentimes when we talk about films that talk about the past they're saying something about now and what they're saying about now is this is not new this has never changed and this will continue to happen and you should be engaging with this film to understand that so it doesn't happen again I do think it probably will happen again because I don't think anyone will learn the lessons from this. I don't think we've learned the lessons from the past, but at least Shaka King is kind of shoving it in your face and asking you to please fucking try to not let this happen again and understand that this film wants to engage with you on a political level because it should engage with you on a political level because this is a story you should fucking know at this point and we should l actually listen to and understand why they did that and how really evil that is. So I don't know if you're like, what, what do they do with number one? Cause this is not, this is weird. Where's what's going on there? So uh, number one, I think I picked for a lot of reasons and that is, um, because I was, you know, I think 2020 was very stressful. Totally into doing any mental health stuff or like doing any sort of meditation before this year, which I now do. And one of the things that really got me into it would help that transition, I think, was this show. And it uses a format that I obviously use with my own things, with like using a conversation and animating around it. And I think Pendleton Ward did that to such an amazing degree with this show, which is Midnight Gospels, my number one thing. Um, but also that final episode where he's talking to his mom, I think was the single best thing I've seen this past year. It was heartbreaking, it was amazing. It was visually spectacular. Um, there's so many times in this where he's breaking the rules, having fun with them. It's like everything I wanted from Loved About Adventure Time. It is definitely that crazy sophomore series that he absolutely deserves, and it doesn't disappoint at all. I think it is probably a show we should be talking about more. It's a show that I sometimes will put on just because it kind of relaxes me and visually is exciting. It's 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 surreal, it's weird, and it's, I think, kind of just the thing I just absolutely just thought was the biggest achievement I saw this year from anyone. And I just can't really get it out of my head, and I thank it for just opening me up a little bit more as well. So, um, number one is The Midnight Gospel. This is, I guess, uh, Pendleton Ward's big comeback to animation after we all kind of assumed he was not maybe ever going to make anything again. He comes back with this trippy, strange, weird, existential, philosophical animation show. And it's the kind of show that a creator or a filmmaker or an animator or probably all those things, in his case, are able to use their clout to make an interesting, weird project that they probably couldn't have pitched before they had a great success that someone would be willing to kind of do that sort of thing with. And that's really very much what the Midnight Gospel is. And it's amazing at that. I love the idea of taking this audio, which is from Duncan Trussell's podcast called the Duncan Trussell Family Hour, takes some of it from that, some of this recorded directly for this, and animates sort of over it. And I think this uses that in such a way that it gives you kind of greater ideas that they're just kind of speaking about and kind of animates them in an interesting way, kind of like breaks your synapses and makes you even more imaginative. For someone like Pendleton Ward, who previously created probably one of the greatest shows of the 2010s, if not the greatest show of the 2010s, and definitely the best animated show of the 2010s, you don't need to at me because it's the truth. I can tell he loves animation because one of the big things of animation, and I've said it a million times and Tiny Toon Adventures said it, I guess, anything is possible in animation. 
and it does that but it does that very much but when people talk about the advent of mtv and how people wouldn't just listen to a record and look into the skies and imagine anymore which is bullshit you can still do that and you can still watch a music video and imagine as well this does that to such a degree where I'm taking in everything that's going on. There's so much beautiful animation going on at once. I can barely take in everything. There's so much happening. When at the same time there's these interesting conversations, it's almost like an intellectual delight for the eyes and ears that I really didn't expect. I don't know if I could really go into the whole idea of every episode necessarily. And I don't even remember the names of the people in most of them. I just remember, you know, talking about like embalming people in the whole industry within that, talking about, you know, being comfortable with death. The idea of life and death and the philosophical meaning and meditation and everything is all throughout this show. And it kind of turned me on to a lot of those sort of things that I hadn't really thought as much about or what this show says about our world and the ideas within our brain while also being this trippy, weird, animated show. I mean, it's like, you know, I get it came out on 420. Obviously, they're doing that kind of audience. But I almost, like, don't want to disrespect it that much. I want to say like this is so much more than just that this is so beautiful and rich tapestry of this whole show and like just saying it's like this trippy weird show is just like sacrificing it for like virtually no reason like there's so much beauty and amazing things going on and a very amazing rich conversation wrapped into some really interesting bizarre trippy animation makes for me an amazing recipe that just hits me in all the right places it makes me feel like the whole day and the, everything that's going on is almost even more worth it just to sort of experience this kind of rich show. And maybe that's why I like to just fall asleep to it because it made me feel like, you know, all is right in the world that something like this fucking show can actually exist. So that was whatever this was. Um, you know, I also had favorites like... Um, I'm not sure what your apartment star is in, but whatever that's in here, maybe that'll be honorable mentions next year. Eurovision as well. I'm sure I forgot something. It was a, a weird year, and I think we're all just sort of coming out of it, hoping 2021 feels a little more normal in terms of movies. There's like regular stuff. I mean, you know, but um, yeah, I hope, you know, I, I, I look at these top 10 lists more as recommendations and how certain critics feel strongly about certain things. So if you haven't watched some of these, please check them out. I think everything on my top 10 list was something I do feel very strongly about. I think is very fantastic. Um, Fast of Night is a great thing for first time filmmakers to watch. Uh, Minari is, um, I think, one of the more um, subdued things on here. Lover's Rock is, just, I don't know, everything I could just name all of them which i just did but that would not be useful um i i think this is um you know it was a weird year and i i have long thought about just doing like best content but that was be silly um youtube channels you know everything i think defunct land especially with that uh, documentary about the sci-fi man in disneyland black femininity tv lots of people like that but i, I be kind of rewinds always killing it i you know, I can't really mention people I work with because that's a little silly. Um, because I think everyone in the cartoon community is doing great work as well. I, I feel like I'm not describing the year well, but I don't know if you can fully describe this year. Even, I would actually say also that Spike Lee short he did on New York is definitely like made me cry. And I thought that was also really good. Maybe I like that as much as the Five Bloods now that I think about it. But this is, uh, you know, I think 2020 is one of those years you look back on and go, yeah, and that's, I don't know. I don't know. It, it it was a lot, and I, I don't know if we can properly sum up all of our feelings about it in a YouTube video, and I think it would be hard to explain everything that happened within this year, but I think it is just um, a pretty substantial, one of the biggest years of our lifetimes, and um, it's hard to kind of explain what we lived through and experienced. And I think it's going to take us a lot of years to really sum up what the fuck that was. But thankfully, it's over. I'm hopeful for the future. Um, so all that. Whatever you enjoyed in 2020 that got you through this year, whether it's a video game, a show, a movie, a podcast, I don't really care. If it's, <laughs> if it's making puzzles, just put it in the comments below. Let me know. I'd prefer a movie or show, but if, if you are like, I want to tell somebody about it, let me know in the comments. This is a weird year. Let's just be chill about it and respectful of everyone but just tell me what you thought some of the best stuff was this year or how you're like wow that was way too high Jim or something like that um let me know in the comments 
uh um thank you very much for watching this past year it's been insane and subscribe if you would like to